Es ist äh, Donnerstag, der 16. April 2015. Hier ist die Sendung Macht und Menschenrechte. Mein Name ist Volker Reusing. Guten Abend. Nachher werde ich ein Interview auf Englisch führen mit ähm, Herrn Reverend Kevin Annette aus Kanada, ähm, äh, Gründer äh, des International ähm, äh, Tribunal of ähm, Crimes of äh, Church and State, ITCCS, äh, einer der wesentlichen Mitbegründer vom ITCCS. Uh, good evening, Miss, Mr. Annette. Mr. Annette, um, when and uh, why has the ITCCS uh, been founded? The ITCCS was founded in the year 2010 in Dublin, Ireland, and its purpose was to unite survivors of crimes within the churches, primarily the Catholic Church, because we were working with Irish survivors who had been abused as children by priests. But now the work has expanded to many countries and it involves people who have faced uh, persecution or crimes both by the government and the churches. Um, um, if I uh, look at your website, I think the, the biggest case that you have had up to now is um, the situation uh, in the Canadian residential schools. That's right. We have the most evidence about that because of the work that I've done since the year 1995 in documenting the death of over 50,000 Aboriginal children. And that very high death rate has recently been, con been confirmed by the Canadian government, which has admitted that many tens of thousands of children died in these Indian schools. And so all of that evidence we've posted online at itccs.org, and it proves that all of the crimes defined as genocide under international law did, in fact, occur in these schools that were run by the Catholic and Protestant churches and uh, the Crown of England. Um, uh, um, can you um, add um, when and in which way has the uh, government um, um, admitted that uh, so many children have died there? The government admitted that in a series of interviews that uh, were made by what's called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or the TRC. It was set up by the government and the churches to hear stories of Native people would be through the schools, but the TRC was an attempt to control the information and to not allow lawsuits and prosecution to occur against the government and the churches. But they had to admit from their own records that they were finding many of the documents that I discovered many years ago and have published, which shows, for example, that uh, over half of these children were dying every year in the schools. One of the reasons they were dying so so many of them were dying is because it was a practice to take the healthy children and to lock them in dormitories where the children were dying of tuberculosis and smallpox. And so the disease would spread and kill off many of the children. And they were doing it deliberately, according to the, the letters of their own officials. That uh, reminds of the time of colonization. Uh, I think the Pox have had a... a uh, a big role uh, also in the colonization of other countries. That's right. They did a very similar thing in many countries. And uh, people are surprised when they hear that it happened in Canada. But the same uh, regime was occurring. For example, the, the schools, these residential schools, were actually established originally uh, by the Jesuits in the late 1800s. It was the same... Uh, school system they set up all over the world to destroy indigenous people, destroy their, their language and their culture, and kill off over half of the children so that the culture was destroyed and the land and the resources were taken over. And that was the same pattern all over the world. Um, so um, is um, taking over the land and the resources one of the main um, motives uh, to put uh, 
the indigenous uh, people in the, into the residential schools. That's right. It was one of the main purposes. Well, one of the reasons we know that is in Canada, when the law was brought in in 1920, uh, that all the children be uh, imprisoned in these schools. Um, most of the schools were built in Western Canada uh, right at the time when the railway was connecting the country and bringing many settlers out west. And so there was a, a great pressure on the government to get the Indians off the land so that the white settlers and, and corporations could have the land. And that's being described in many letters that we published from Indian agents and missionaries that say this is the purpose of the schools, to get them off the land so that we can have the land. And your uh, presentation to the International Law Court of Justice, um, uh, you say that um, the crime against humanity and um, the genocide has um, uh, been, has taken place in the time from uh, 1889 to uh, 1996, if I got it correctly. Um, which uh, events have been in, in these years? Well, the, the genocide, we've discovered that it happened in different stages. The first stage in the late 1800s was to try to destroy as many of the, the the children as possible. So you find the death rate was very high in those early years. By the time of the 1930s and, and the time of World War II, many of the, the, much of the land had been taken already. And so the main purpose was not so much killing them as controlling them, uh, getting them off the land, uh, in effect, brainwashing them so that they would forget about their culture. And, um, and, and so by then they, they got the native leaders themselves to help do this to their own people. So many of the chiefs were allowed to keep their own children out of the schools if they went around and gathered up the other children. So they really pitted people against one another, uh, you know, in order to control the natives. And still today, in Canada, under the Indian Act, which is a law, uh, natives are not allowed uh, the same legal rights as Canadians. They are in a different, different category. They're not really citizens. They are what's called wards of the state, which means that the government controls all of their actions when they're living on these reservations. So uh, it's still a very colonial system governing the Indians in Canada. Um, I've, I have, have not known that, that it's, uh, uh, they still don't have the same rights. I thought that they have an assembly of First Nations which uh, strongly lobbies for them. If I look into the um, Roman Statute, um, and I've, I've seen your presentation, it seems to me that many parts of the Roman Statute regarding Article 6, genocide, and Article um, 7, uh, crime against humanity, uh, are, are fulfilled, at least uh, regarding the ob objective part, what has been done.
for the crimes they committed. And it'll, and that's one of the reasons that we brought the case to the International Common Law Court in Brussels, because Canada clearly is guilty of genocide, as are the churches in Canada. Um, for example, many people, I mean, many children have died and um, you have uh, described uh, conducts which, uh, where, where people cannot move freely and where uh, suffering is inflicted uh, on them, uh, which um, well, looks like a, a torture, for example. That's right, and these crimes are still happening today. I know because I've not only researched this for 20 years, but I worked as a minister on the streets of Vancouver where many of the Aboriginal people live and die. And I know uh, from experience that the death rate among Natives is as high now as it always was, uh, even 40, 50 years ago. And many of the Aboriginal women still go missing and are killed uh, by police and by other people, especially on the West Coast of Canada. There's hundreds of missing, missing Aboriginal people. Uh, and many Aboriginal men are killed by police in jail they're, they're still forced off their land all the time. Many of the homeless Indians have been forced off their land by big uh, companies, you know, the, the water companies, uranium companies. In order to get their land, the native chiefs will sign away the land of their own people to the company and then force their own people off the land. That happens all over Canada. So these crimes are still happening today. And uh, so have the residential schools been closed? They were closed. 1996, but uh, they were, what was happening in the schools is still happening through the government system where children are taken out of their own families and put in the homes of white people. Uh, in fact, there's more Native children in white foster homes today than there were in residential schools. And in the white foster homes, they're not allowed to speak their language and they, they lose contact with their culture. So it's the same genocide happening except in a more private way now, not through the school, but through white foster families all over Canada. Um, more assimilation, not, not killing today. Yeah, that's right, assimilation, but it leads to the death at a, young, at a younger age when people have lost contact with who, their identity. Many of them lose the desire to live. They become lost people. And uh, I see that, you know, when, we, for example, as a minister, I do funerals. Uh, of Native people all the time, and it's not unusual for a Native man to die of diabetes uh, when he's in his 40s, which is a very uh, much earlier than you would normally die from diabetes, but Native people die from it at a much younger rate. Um, about one th third of all the people in prisons in Canada are Native, even though they're only 2% of the population. So those are the signs that these you know, the effect on, on people is still very, very bad. Um, if I uh, look, um, well, if um, a settlers, if corporations have been greedy and uh, wanted the land and the resources of the Indians, um, why um, do you think that it is also uh, regarding uh, the subjective uh, element, um, genocide, and um, if one uh, wants to rob someone, Else, I would rather think that it's crime against humanity. Is there really been uh, an aim uh, uh, to to destroy people? It was the aim from the very beginning, and it had a, a religious justification. Uh, the missionaries genuinely believed that if Native people had to convert to to Catholicism or to Christianity or they didn't have the right to live. We see that in many of their, their documents, that it's better that a native die if he's going to remain a pagan than, um, you know, than otherwise. So there was that belief as well. But still today, as I mentioned, in the law in Canada, um, natives are second-class citizens. They don't have the same rights. And that's what you find in any system of genocide, that, that they are still at a legal disadvantage. Um, um, you have uh, brought um, that uh, a case um, on uh, the residential schools uh, in Canada um, against, I think, the three main uh, churches, uh, the Vatican 
and also the government of Canada. Um, um, can you show how the churches and the uh, government, uh, by law, by institutions, have uh, cooperated uh, in, um, in those crimes? Well, the government and the churches, in the very beginning, had a joint plan of how to conduct the killing of children in these residential schools. We know because we publish documents online on, on several of my websites. Uh, and the documents show that in the year 1910, there was a contract, an agreement between the, the churches, the Catholic Church, the Anglican or Church of England, and the, uh, the United Church, which is the church I used to be in before they expelled me. All three churches and the government of Canada had an agreement that they would operate these, these schools together. And we found the very first year that the, uh, the residential schools opened, the death rate was already almost 40 to 50 percent in the very first year. The death rate was very low outside the residential school, the death rate for Indians, but inside the residential school, it stayed at a very high rate over many, many years. And so this shows, you know, the intention to, to kill off these children. Otherwise, the death rate would have come down. Um, but it also showed we have evidence that the government and the church's plan, for example, setting up sterilization programs where government doctors would go in and sterilize or, or make it fertile young Indian boys and girls if they were continuing to speak their own language. So that's one of the definitions of genocide when you're stopping births, when you're stopping a group from breeding, you're trying to destroy them. The, the, you know, many of the techniques that were used uh, in Russia under Stalin, in, in Germany under Hitler, they borrowed from the things that were happening to Indians in North America much earlier than, than when their regimes were in power. So um, we find it was a definite intent by both the government and the churches to do these things. And then to cover it up afterwards, they've, they've destroyed graves of, we found 28 mass grave sites in Canada where Native children are buried. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police have dug up and destroyed those grave sites. They've burned evidence. They've done everything possible to cover up this crime. Um, if I um, um, while can man say um, how um, about which in which ways many of those fifth uh, estimated fifty thousand. Um, um, victims have died. Has it uh, mostly been uh, by illnesses or by violence or by uh, by starvation? Or by which, how have they done it? Mostly. The majority of the children who died died from starvation and disease because the system was set up to create disease and to create starvation deliberately. Uh, there was a lot of violence. For example, many of the survivors, and I've interviewed at several thousand survivors over the years, uh, all of their testimonies are on record. But time and again, I heard from the survivors that whenever they showed up in the school as little children, they were beaten and often raped right away. That was the first thing that happened to them. And that terrorized them and made them obey. Uh, so the violence, the sexual assaults, the tortures were standard practice on all of the children. Very few, I've rarely heard any story from anyone who didn't experience those crimes. And so it was a regime of terror at the beginning, but it was mostly disease and starvation that they relied on to kill off the greatest number. And uh, so that violence has not uh, been because of ne neglect, who has been uh, responsible um, in those uh, schools, but it has been done systematically, it has been wanted. It was systematically, and as a matter of fact, if the people who worked in the schools, the white people, if they, if they refused to hurt the children, they were fired right away. I've spoken to people who used to work in these schools, and whenever they showed any compassion for the children, they were fired right away. They only allowed employees who were brutal and sadistic to stay in the system. So um, that made sure not only that the children were harmed, but that everything was, everyone stayed quiet and didn't talk about it, because they were all guilty and they needed to cover it up to protect one another. So 
that's why many of these things were not known about for many years. Hmm. Um, if I have uh, understood uh, correctly your pleasure um, to um, the um, jury or to the um, uh, prosecutor of uh, the International Crime Law Court uh, of Justice regarding the Indian residential schools, then you, I think you have talked about a link between uh, those residential trafficking. Uh, in how far is, uh, is there a connection? There's a strong connection because the the, one of the purposes of the residential schools in Canada was to provide children for child rapists, uh, pedophiles inside the church, but also other, other men who would come in and use the children. We have many eyewitnesses who describe uh, people showing up and taking children away and then the children never being seen again or they come back very hurt. And we know that the residential schools provided children to, um, to these people and that the, the system is continuing today. We've had eyewitnesses who describe being part of child trafficking networks, especially on the west coast of Canada, to very elite uh, wealthy clubs. There was one in Vancouver called the Vancouver Club, and many businessmen and politicians and judges are members. We've had many eyewitnesses come forward who describe judges and other politicians being involved in this. Just like in Belgium, the Marc Dutroux case, and in Belgium and Holland and other countries in Europe, where senior politicians and judges are involved in, in trafficking children, we have the same system here in Canada. Well, and that's one of the reasons that we brought charges against the Vatican and others senior officials in the Vatican for trafficking and harming children today. So, you know, the, these crimes continue. They, there's no reason why they would stop. Um, if I understand it uh, correctly, then uh, this has happened also systematically and also in a rather large scale. It's not, a, uh, it's rather not a traumatized a people who have traumati uh, been traumatized themselves and then um, uh, give uh, give further the trauma to other people, but it has that has been organized. That's right. It isn't just that the people who have been abused become abusers themselves, because that is often what happens. It's that it's a, it's a very organized system of child trafficking, and it's all over the world. We know that organized crime is involved with it. The mafia syndicate in Europe called Drangheta. Uh, we know from several insiders who were married to Drangheta members have given their testimony and they describe how they provide children for some of these satanic rituals and, and you know experimental purposes and that. Uh, they make a lot of money by trafficking children all over the world. And so it is a, a very uh, wealthy system uh, of providing children. Um, um, and um, this... Is this a system rather for uh, for for abuse or rather for um, satanic uh, rituals or something like that? It, it's for both of them. We know that children are uh, provided. Sometimes the children are provided, say, to couples that cannot have children and and, and need a baby. Hmm. So they, they 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 provide them, you know, from orphanages and that. Hmm. We also provide them to pedophiles and you know people who like to rape children have sex with children, they're provided for that purpose. But they are also, the same group provides them as well for these satanic rituals. And often the children in satanic rituals have been raised within families that are members of a cult, and they provide their own children. It's one of the rituals that you have to be able to provide your own child for sacrifice if you to remain a member of, of the cult. And we have that from several eyewitnesses in uh, a woman, Tos Nienhaus, and and Marie von Billenberg, both of whom live in, in Holland, were members of these cults, and they've given their testimony to our tribunal uh, how this happened. So it, it's all of these crimes, you know, all of these different uses of children. Um, uh, I imagine if there are really high-ranking um, people involved in that, then that it's maybe also a system of... Um, 
organized extortability so that uh, mafia organizations uh, have a certain amount of control over judges, over politicians, and so on. That's exactly right. That's exactly how um, politicians and judges are trapped. Uh, they're invited to ceremonies, and then they witness these horrible things, and they're, they're blackmailed and controlled that way. Also, um, Anne-Marie van Bilderberg, uh, who is married to a member of Drangheda, say that they, the Drangheda men will often marry uh, female judges, female lawyers, or politicians, and then control them that way as well. So it is definitely for, for uh, blackmail purposes, yes. Um, have you, do you have an idea when that has started? Well, I would imagine possibly that it has started with a greed for resources and with colonialism and racism. Is that ab uh, organized abuse of uh, children, uh, child, um, the overlapping with child uh, trafficking may be a newer phenomenon? Uh, no, it's actually, it goes back many centuries. We find evidence uh, of course, in Catholic Church records of, of this going on, the, the policy in the Catholic Church that ch that child rape is to be concealed, it's a policy crimen solicitanus, and, and uh, it, it goes back uh, to at least 1929, but even before that, the Church was practicing that, that children, when they're harmed, uh, they're silenced. The priest is not allowed to talk about it, and if they talk about it, they're excommunicated. So that's an old policy inside the church. Um, we also know that in, in areas in, uh, that have been colonized, many of the native children were just used in this way because uh, in the opinion of the church, they didn't have souls and they could die and there wouldn't, it wouldn't be a sin to kill these children because they weren't Christian or they weren't Catholic. And so that's why in, in many of the colonized areas of the native people, why these crimes are so common because they didn't believe that they were human beings. Unbelievable. And at the same time, they wanted uh, to, 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 uh, to, uh, to mission the people, to make Christians of them. It's, it's unbelievable. It's, uh... well, I know, and, and the, the policy was, to give you an example, when the, when the Vatican, uh, the Catholic Church invaded uh, Mexico in the New World, uh, they said that if uh, an Indian there converted and became a Catholic. They could become a slave. You couldn't kill them, but you, you had to make them a slave. That's the most that they could expect, either to be killed or become a slave. And um, it's still the opinion that anyone who is not a baptized Catholic is not a true human being and can sh and should be enslaved. And that's, that policy has never changed. So um, that's one of the reasons that we brought charges against various popes. Uh, Joseph Ratzinger was one of them because he had, he had been involved personally in covering up these child abuses. But every pope who's in office has to abide by these policies. What I do not uh, really understand, uh, Pope Benedict um, the Sixteenth, um, maybe he has been emotionally overwhelmed and not been um, not been able to deal with the, uh, with the issue, and had, maybe he has been too much shocked when he heard of, has learned about it. I, I can't say. I don't know what his personal response was, but we do know from evidence that uh, he did sign letters where in Germany, uh, in Ireland, and in the United States, he ordered bishops to not just cover up the child trafficking going on, but to destroy evidence and to silence the people responsible. Mm. And the, there were lawyers who have copies of this letter, and they actually tried to, uh, an American lawyer named Jonathan Levy tried to extradite the Pope to America to face charges, but the, uh, the Vatican ignored the summons, and the United States government supported the Vatican. Um, but there is definite evidence that he is personally liable uh, you know, for, for concealing these crimes. Uh, I didn't know about that, uh, that uh, he has um, so actively um, concealed uh, those crimes and um, that he has, um, wanted a destruction of evidence. That's, I did not know that. Yes, and also the fact 
that like like every pope, he was uh, had responsibility because he was the chief officer in the church, and so he has what's called executive uh, responsibility uh, for any crime committed by his organization. So that's mm. another reason why he was guilty. I understand. Um, if I look into the Roman Statute, I see in Article 28 as the responsibility um, of, um, of, um, of um, uh, chief uh, officers that they have to control the people below them and that they can become uh, criminally uh, liable even if they don't um, harm anyone uh, themselves. That's exactly right, that they have, even if they didn't commit the crime themselves, they're responsible legally for the crimes of their priests and other people in their organization. Um, well, I'm um, used uh, more to uh, public public uh, courts, and um, so I um, need to ask, um, does the International Common Law Court of Justice, which is a, as a court belonging to the ITCCS, um, does it regard its uh, judgments as rather symbolic, like the ones of the uh, Russell Tribunal, or is uh, legally binding? We have been told that the decisions made in the International Common Law Court have standing in other courts. And for two reasons, because under international law, um, the country, citizens in a country where the courts and the government are involved in colluding in a crime, they have the right to form their own what are called citizen tribunals. And under the law, the decisions of those tribunals have weight in other courts, which means, for example, in Europe, a court could take our evidence and our verdicts Uh, about the various people which found guilty. And they can issue arrest warrants based on that evidence. And so it does have standing in other courts, as well as having symbolic power, uh, to say, yes, here's the evidence proving the guilt of, for example, Joseph Ratzinger, Elizabeth Windsor in England, and, and other officials. Um, um, on the website of the ITCCS, I find that um, the International Income Law Court Uh, of justice um, um, relies on common law. Um, where do I find the uh, common law that um, people, not, uh, not only the state, uh, can um, create a court? That's right, because the common law is based on uh, a tradition in Europe that isn't Roman law. Roman law says that only the rulers can establish courts and establish the law. But, but the tribal tradition, which it comes out of Germany actually, in the Saxon tribal tradition, that says uh, the people are the source of authority. And that's where why in the American Declaration of Independence it says that the people are sovereign. That means they're self-governing. And as self-governing people, we have the inherent right to form courts, to, to arrest people who are threatening our community and that kind of thing. So, yes, it's, it comes from a different legal tradition than Roman law. Uh, it, common law says everyone has the ability to, to uh, establish such courts when the, when the existing... Hello? Yes. Um, um, when uh, when uh, does anyone have uh, the right to establish uh, such common law courts? They have the right at any time to, to form such a court, but they have to also show that the courts in their own country are not addressing these crimes and they have no other recourse but to form their own courts. And we prove that in Canada. In the first, first common law court case that was heard in Brussels, it was about the evidence of genocide in Canada because we had tried for almost 15 years in Canadian courts to charge the Crown of England and the government and the churches of Canada with genocide. And time and again, the, the courts in Canada refused to rule on the issue of genocide. They, they, they refused to allow the case into their courts. And so we had no other recourse but to go and form our own courts. Um, uh, so if I get this correctly, you have uh, gone 
uh, several times to the police and uh, requested the police. Um, he has made a charge there to so um, to um, have it uh, prosecuted in the uh, public legal system of Canada. That's right. As early as 1998, I went to the police in, in on the west coast of Canada with the, this evidence, and they refused to investigate because the the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Canada are themselves guilty of these crimes. They were involved in bringing children to the residential schools. Uh, and so they, were, they refused to be involved in, in looking into it. Uh, we went to the Supreme Court of Canada on two occasions. We tried in local courts and they always said the same thing and the police refused to investigate. So that we found that the whole system in Canada is determined to deny this crime altogether, and that's why we had to go elsewhere. Um, if I, um, well, I ask myself, um, do, you have not gone to the International Criminal Court at The Hague, I suppose, because it cannot um, deal with uh, cases um, earlier than um, uh, July the 1st of 2002, and it has, most has happened um, um, uh, before that date. That's exactly right. The, the statute of limitations in the ICC court uh, prevented us from, uh, you know, bringing these crimes up to 1996. And we also find in the, the like, for example, the International Court of Justice in The Hague, they tend to resolve disputes between nations, but they don't have the jurisdiction to have individuals bring charges of genocide against a mm. whole government. Uh, and so... That's another reason why we had to establish the the, the common law court of justice. Um, can do you know an uh, historical example of, uh, of a common law court? Um, not in the way that we've set up. Although um, the the recognition of, of the right to form common law courts is in in many legal decisions, especially in America and England, where they upheld the right under the Magna Carta. For, for citizens, you know, to to defend themselves against their own governments, and this is in many ways what we're doing. Hmm. And uh, what um, does uh, determine the geographical scope of the jurisdiction of a common law court? The common law uh, court claims universal jurisdiction. That means um, because their, their, their power is derived not from a mandate from a government, but is uh, inherent, is an, a, a right born into all of us, it doesn't restrict its jurisdiction. And it, so it claims the uh, universal uh, jurisdiction. So that means, for example, in Germany, even though you may not have the same common law tradition as in English law, anyone would have the right to form this kind of court over any issue, whether criminal law or civil law. Hmm. Um, I, I, I don't know it that uh, from a, a German um, legal um, tradition, if I look in the German basic law, uh, they said in Article 20 that uh, um, people um, uh, have the rule by um, uh, by elections, by then uh, by referenda and uh, and um, there's uh, no mention uh, about a, a direct uh, rule um, about uh, courts set up directly uh, by the people. It's not explicitly mentioned in the German Basic Law. No, and it doesn't surprise me because most countries in the world don't like the idea of citizens taking the law into their own hands. It undercuts their authority and their power. But um, again, this, this is not a right derived from a government. It's derived from nature. It's part mm -hmm. of natural law. Mm -hmm. in, um, I, um, we have in our law, we have something uh, like called a basic right called uh, to resistance, a uh, right to resistance, uh, taking the power into your hand, and but only uh, for the protection of the legal order as such, uh, of uh, the protection of our basic uh, law as such, um, of, of our basic rights 
of our democracy, of the rule of the law, and um, the the very core of our basic law. And I think it's also in the un uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights that uh, people can uh, do resistance um, in order to protect the system of universal human rights. That's right. And also, in uh, I'm not sure what the law is in Germany, but in many countries you have citizen arrest laws, where if a, if you see a crime and there's not a policeman around, or even if you suspect somebody might be hurt, hmm. like a child, you have the right as a citizen to arrest somebody and hold them until the police come and you can turn them oh. over to the police. We That's a right recognized by many governments. Hmm. Um, what is your assessment regarding the work of the Canadian Truth Commission? The Truth Commission, uh, you mean the Truth and Reconciliation yes. Commission in yes. Canada? Yes, that's what I mean. It was set up by the government to conceal these crimes. And we know that when you look at the mandate given to it by the government. Um, and the mandate was simply to, to record evidence but not to prosecute. Uh, you are not allowed to prosecute the churches and government. Um, that, that witnesses' statements are looked at and censored by the government before they're admitted as evidence. And it's, uh, it was set up in 2008 after many of these lawsuits had started and as the work we were doing was exposing how crimes against humanity had occurred in these Indian schools. And so it was an attempt by the government and churches to stop these lawsuits and to control it before it got too far. And uh, they have definitely kept many of the stories and the evidence out of the media. And they've stopped these lawsuits from, from exposing what really happened. So in, in many, many ways, it's what's called a miscarriage of justice. It's obstructing justice because it's stopping the true story from getting out and not allowing people you know, to take action in court against these criminal bodies. So imagination, even, which, which I have had... Even name the name, like at, a, at, a, at a, one of these uh, truth and reconciliation events, hmm. you cannot get up and name the name of a man who harmed you in a residential school. They prohibit the naming of names or any reference to evidence that might uh, involve the death of a child. So it's designed to protect the government of churches, really. I have read on their own website that they um, do not have uh, the power to enforce uh, the appearance of anyone specific. They cannot, uh, like a court, uh, enforce that people um, appear before um, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. That's right. And, and also, under international law, governments and bodies like churches that have committed crimes do not have the right to investigate their own crimes because that's a biased, uh, you know, a prejudiced hmm. uh, thing. You can't expect there to be an honest description of what happened uh, in, in those regimes. And so the very setting up of the, of the TRC is a violation of international law. There should have been an outside body that came in and did the investigation, and that's why we set up our tribunal to document it as a non-governmental body. Hmm. Um, if I look at um, the work of the International uh, Criminal Court uh, at the Hague, as they only um, uh, judge on individuals, only on the guilt of individuals. And if I see your recomm uh, recommendation to the International Law Court of uh, Justice regarding um, um, the uh, crimes in the um, uh, Canadian residential schools. Um, you have uh, focused on organizations, not um, or not only on uh, the criminal responsibility of individuals, and on which uh, legal basis. Well, the the legal doctrine of um a collective responsibility for a crime. Uh, and this was recognized at, uh, at the Nuremberg trials and other places where they did try individuals, but it was because these individuals rep 
represented what were known as criminal regimes that were attempting to commit guys a uh, war, or uh, they were trying to commit crimes under the appearance of war. Um, and the system as a whole was responsible for these crimes, not just individuals. And so we relied on that. Um, at the United Nations, there's um, a principle, the uh, set of laws called the Nuremberg Statutes. And it says that uh, citizens have the right to form these courts to look into the crimes of their own governments. And the government as a whole has to be tried. It isn't just individuals that are responsible. There were laws in place setting up the Indian residential schools. The Crown of England brought in these laws. The churches as an entire body enforced the laws. And so the institutions are guilty. Um. Um, oh, can you repeat, where do I find these, these principles? Um, they, they have uh, this... At the United hmm. Nations, it's called the Nuremberg Legal Statutes. They, I believe they were passed in 1950. And they have a, the set of principles governing how to conduct uh, investigations into, into war crimes. Okay. Is it a resolution of the UN General Assembly or is it... Um, um, the code uh, for the um, for the court which has uh, prosecuted um, um, s uh, s several of the um, 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 highest uh, Nazi uh, criminals. Yeah, it was uh, actually a set of legal principles that they passed. Uh, it was called the Nuremberg Legal Principles. I believe 1950. Yeah. Hmm. And uh, what does it mean if you're an organization, um, if it's against an uh, um, organization, if an organization has been found um, guilty, uh, what it, does it then mean who is go, uh, has to go to, into jail? Well, it means that not just the chief officers, but any member of the organization can be prosecuted because they hold collective responsibility for everything done within the organization. Um, there's, a, there's another covenant a convention at the United Nations into what's called transnational criminal organizations. And that means criminal bodies that operate across borders. Uh, you know, the mafia, the Drangheta being one of them. Uh, the Vatican itself is a transnational criminal organization because it has a policy to protect child rapists and to traffic children within their body. So as a transnational criminal organization, it means that any member of their organization can be considered guilty when they give money to the organization or, or anything like that. They are guilty of complicity in those crimes. Uh, um, think, well, I think if I look at the, the Vatican or at the main churches at Canada, they, they are doing so many things. They are also doing um, uh, very good things, uh, very, um, very charitable things um, uh, uh, to other parts of the population. Well, it's true. The mafia also contribute money to the poor. The, uh, but that doesn't, the very fact that an organization is also doing charitable works doesn't negate their criminal action. It doesn't absolve them from their criminal responsibility for their other actions. So the issue of charity and the other things they do doesn't enter in legally, um, you know, to to the the guilt of of these organizations. And it, wouldn't it be more precise to say that it's a certain a department or a certain uh, arm or a certain network of people within those organizations which uh, need to be considered as criminal? No, it's it's in the case, for example. Vatican, they have a policy that governs all clergy anywhere in the world. It's called Crimen Solicitanus. It's, it's a policy that the President Pope Francis also affirmed uh, that when he was speaking to Italian bishops, he said that police are not to be told of when children are harmed within the Catholic Church. That's a criminal conspiracy to conceal a crime. And um, that policy governs every single Catholic clergy anywhere in the world. So it's a binding policy on all of their employees. 
coming from the highest office. As a matter of fact, in the in the policy crimen solicitanus, it uh, mm-hmm. it says refers to this policy as being part of the holy office, and that means it's coming from the Pope himself. So no, these are when when the policy governs everyone in organization, it means that the institution as a whole is guilty. And um, well, I have not read uh, yet um, the mentioned um, resolution of the UN regarding transnational criminal organizations. So I need to ask, does it also apply on international organizations under public law or only uh, under um, private law? Well, it's, it's, it governs criminal law. Um, and so uh, the, it, it's a convention. I think it's called the Convention on Transnational Organized Crime. Um, and it was passed, I think, in the 2000 or in the last 10, 15 years sometime. And if governments are supposed to bring in um, legislation to apply this law in their own country, and not, not all the governments have done that, but um, it allows uh, transnational criminals like, for example, the mafia to be prosecuted. Uh, and, and it was aimed primarily at the mafia and organized crime, but it can apply in this case to any organization that's committing uh, crimes which they define as, for example, laundering money, mm. uh, trafficking human beings or trafficking drugs and that kind of thing. Mafia is under private law, so I thought it's, it's, uh, maybe there's that uh, prosecution under, um, against uh, on the, that it's possibly not applicable to uh, a public law organizations. Um, well, it would be a, a private organization being prosecuted, but under um, public law, as in government would bring in legislation allowing that law to be hmm. used in their own country against hmm. these bodies. Um. Uh, can you uh, tell me uh, what has been the role of the British Crown regarding the Indian, Indian residential schools? Well, the, the Crown of England was the main. The Crown of England and the Vatican were were the two major institutions responsible for these crimes of genocide. The Crown of England um, was the head the head of state in Canada over the, the churches and the government. They also it was an act of uh, what's called the Privy Council in London that established these residential schools. We have that in, in our, on our websites, copies of these acts that came from uh, the Privy Council office in London, which is the, which is the Queen's own executive body. Uh, they created these residential schools. They brought in all the laws allowing children to be abducted. Um, at every level, the Crown of England was the, you know, the, the main legal body uh, you know, responsible for these crimes. And I've seen in your presentation um, excerpts from uh, debates in the Canadian Parliament. Um, I wonder if the members of the Parliament and how far they have been involved or in how far they probably only have been careless. Well, I, I first wrote, uh, over 12 years ago, I wrote to every member of Parliament. Uh, uh, about the crimes and about the, the, re- the responsibility of the government for these crimes. I never heard back from any of them. But when the, they set up their own investigation, this Truth and Reconciliation Commission, the members of parliament are not allowed to talk about it because they all take an oath of loyalty to the crown, to Queen Elizabeth. And so they, they are her servants. They are her legal bonded servants. And they're not allowed to accuse her of any crime. Uh, so they are, in a way, just uh, irrelevant uh, to this whole process um, because they, they are not, and some of them have even told me this, they are not legally allowed to even address this issue of genocide by the state. Hmm. Um, in how far is uh, the ITCCS and is the International Law Court of Justice accepted um, 
um, by the population and uh, by public institutions? They, it's recognized informally. I've had lawyers and police say they recognize the truth of what we're doing, but it's not recognized officially. And I would say most people in the population can't accept the fact that we can put the government on trial, that we can put the government and churches on trial. They say, well, it may be a symbolic decision, but it, it can't be enforced. Well, that isn't true. We found already that uh, it has a very powerful effect when you bring out these verdicts. We, um, Pope Benedict and three other top officials of the church, all of them have resigned after they were indicted in our court cases. And they know very well that when that evidence of their guilt comes out, that other courts can take action. And so I think by their resignation, they're proving that they know, you know the power of what we're doing. Um, regarding Pope Benedict, um, I still have some thoughts. And I have read in the um, Deutsche Wirtschaftsnachrichten that he has had big uh, difficulties uh, with uh, putting his power through in view of the Vatican Bank. Um, um, what makes you sure that um, his resignation has been rather in connection with uh, the verdict of the International Law Court of Justice and not uh, in connection um, with uh, his problems with the Vatican Bank or with uh, 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 other reasons? I think he resigned for a number of reasons. It wasn't simply because of the verdict of, of our court. Uh, I think that the verdict of our court added um, fuel to the fire, if you like. It, it added a evidence of his own personal guilt. But you're right that there were other crises within the Vatican Bank and other pressures within the church that certainly added to his, you know, his, his resigning. So, um, how long has this taken between the verdict and this resignation? Well, he resigned on February the 11th, 2013. Two weeks after that, the verdict was announced on February 25th. That's it? We also... Mm. Yeah, it was, it was two weeks. He resigned two weeks before the verdict uh, of the court, and uh, which came on February 25th, 2013. Mm. He resigned the same month. We also know that the Spanish government was considering issuing an arrest warrant against him, and they sent a diplomatic note to the Vatican Secretary of State on February 6th, which was five days before his resignation. Uh, so we know that that probably played a, played a role in his resigning. Um, why um, um, has uh, the, the Spanish, uh, uh, did the Spanish, uh, has the Spanish uh, been involved? Well, one of the reasons is there's a, a, a court cases in Spain that have proved that under the Franco dictatorship, the Catholic Church uh, trafficked over 300,000 children of political prisoners. And the President Pope Francis did the same thing when he was an archbishop in Argentina during the military dictatorship there. They regularly had practice of selling children of political prisoners for lots of money. They, I, I, I met in Barcelona with some of these survivors who as children were trafficked by the Catholic Church. The, the Catholic Church made over $20 billion doing this in Spain over about 30 years. And the Spanish government had already started their own court cases against the Catholic Church, based on that, so they felt confident. I think, based on that, that you know, um, that they could prosecute uh, the Pope, you know, because of that those, those cases they had already begun. And um, really, three three hundred thousand uh, people. Does did it mean um, abduction uh, of the children? Uh, for, for adoption by um, people who are um, uh, faithful, uh, who, who follow uh, the government, or does it mean uh, to send uh, children to, uh, uh, to people who do violence against them? I see. Uh, bo both of them. Uh, there have been some articles written in, uh, uh, that I have that I can, I can send them to you. Uh, describing these cases in Spain. And the main purpose of it, it was set up right after Franco took power. And he wanted to take the children of his political opponents uh, who had, you know, fought for the Republic, who were left wing and that, and he wanted to take their children and, and convert them into loyal fascists, loyal Catholics. And so they deliberately put them in the home of members of his government and others to raise
raise them as supporters of his government, um, maybe as, as revenge against his opponents or whatever. But the same children were also sent into the homes quite often of, of child rapists and others who would use them. So it was, it was both of those things. If I understand it, then there probably it's a Spain there has not been such a, 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 a death rate, that, but it seems that uh, probably even more children have been abducted from their families. Yes, you find it, uh, we find in Catholic countries, especially less developed Catholic countries, the, the incidence uh, of, of child trafficking is much higher because people traditionally don't challenge the churches Catholic Church and it has a lot of power to take children and, and they can disappear and, and nobody asks any questions. It's the same thing you have here in Canada with Indians. So many Indians can go missing and, and nobody seems to really care. <laughs> and um, how is the acceptance for the International Law Court of Justice among the uh, indigenous people at Canada? We've had a, a, a lot of Native people support our case, uh, but not the Native leaders who are funded by the government. Um, and so we often will have eyewitnesses who will tell their story, and, and we have local courts that are convened to hear people's stories, but their chiefs who get the government money discourage them from coming into our courts. They rely on the Canadian government crown courts. So there is that division within the Native community as well. Um, Article uh, 21, paragraph 3, Roman Statute prescribes that uh, the application and the interpretation of the Roman Statute by the International Criminal Court has to be compatible with the internationally recognized human rights. I guess that it mainly refers to the universal human rights of the UN and in how far does the International Cam Law Court of Justice um, refer to international uh, human rights or use them for the interpretation of international criminal law? You mean how much do we rely on these conventions, the international, like the Human Rights UN Declaration of Human Rights and that kind of thing? Yes. Uh, we, we rely on it as one source, but not the only source, because um, we know that, for example, the conventions passed at the United Nations require uh, enabling legislation by governments. Um, and the, 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 um, what we are saying is that the, uh, our court doesn't require enabling legislation by governments uh, because then they can be controlled politically. Uh, for example, in Canada, the Convention on Genocide, which the United Nations passed in 1948. The convention was adopted in Canada in 1952, but it didn't have any enabling legislation to allow it to become law in Canada until the year 2000. They did that deliberately so that they could not, there could not be cases brought in Canada about the residential schools. So if we based it on those conventions alone, we would be limited in our ability to act because of whether or not the government has that legislation in your own country. And like I say, common law as universal jurisdiction is not dependent on the action of governments. Hmm. Um, can already uh, be mentioned that you have. We did adjudicate a case, a second case, involving global child trafficking. And uh, the three primary defendants were the present Pope Francis, Jorge Bogoglio, uh, the head of the Jesuits, uh, Adolfo Bichon, and the Archbishop of Canterbury in England, Justin Welby. Now, that case was adjourned. Um, uh, because after they began to investigate, they found it was a huge case. There was an enormous amount of evidence involving the evidence that these churches, especially, were trafficking.
trafficking children. And they created an investigative body to go and gather more evidence to work with groups like Interpol. Uh, and in the future, they're going to, they are going to uh, adjudicate a, a case on that basis, but they needed more time to gather evidence and to do this work and to protect witnesses because they found they didn't have the resources to, to do the right job, to protect people, to do this case in the proper way. And so, for example, we did, we have worked with Interpol in Europe and we gave them information that uh, a number of months ago they used to arrest over a thousand people and to free children who had been abducted in Belgium. So we we're doing a lot of work, um, you know, in the community with, with police forces and that to gather these evidence, but we expect that that case is going to c commence again. Um, how um, can the public uh, support um, the International Law Court of Justice? There are efforts in Germany of groups uh, to look at cases of, say, police harassment or corruption in the courts in Germany uh, using our model. And uh, we do have contacts in Germany uh, of, of groups looking to educate the public and to involve them in these crimes and also to protect the children in their, in their communities. From, from these crimes. And so um, I am going to be in Germany uh, in June and July during the summer uh, as part of a European tour I'm, I'm making to unite many of these groups that are working to create common law groups and courts. And uh, they can contact us. Um, I, I believe you have my, uh, my email information in that on our websites. And uh, they can learn, begin to educate themselves and invite me to the community and we can we can work together on these projects. Okay, maybe when you are in Germany, maybe there's a possibility to see you personally, so in order uh, to understand more about uh, common law. Yes, absolutely. I, I plan to give public talks uh, to meet with groups uh, as well, and uh, I'd be happy to do that for you and, and others, and we could do more interviews on that. Okay. Many thanks uh, for for the interview, and I wish you much, much, uh, much power for, for for your for your work and um, well to, to you, find. I appreciate the interview, and I will. If you send me another email, I will I will send you all of these links and information about where I'm coming. Or, where do you live in Germany? Where are you located? Um, or oh, I'm living in Wuppertal. It's uh, close uh, to to Düsseldorf. Cologne. Oh, yeah. Cologne. Cologne. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll definitely let you know. Uh, it should be around the middle of June when I arrive, but uh, I, I will let you know by email. Okay. Thank you. Could you possibly send me a link to your interview when it's posted online, and I can share it with other people I know in Germany? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Okay, many, many thanks and uh, good luck with your work. Thank you. Bye for now. Goodbye.